All right, well, welcome to the last session uh, of our Grace Seminar today. It's been interesting to hear everybody talk. Uh, it's, I'm sure it's been interesting for all the, the speakers to get up here and, and, and speak in front of folks. It's a daunting task, especially when you may have not known the doctrine for, you know, very, very uh, a big part of your life. But uh, I've got grace and its implications uh, today. So I'm going to wind it up. Uh, and so one thing I wanted, my take on this whole this whole uh, thing that was put together by started with Mark and then uh, Phil and Myron is it's been explained to me. Sometimes we look at this and we, we see, man, there's a lot of black up here. And, and you're telling me that the red part is for my participation. And I was showing Mark, I, I had in, in my Bible by Romans something like 5% actually of all the words in Scripture were attributed to Paul. And as was said, not all of that. You've got to rightly divide Paul, but 5%. And sometimes people look at that and they may get angry and they think, you're telling me that all of this here uh, is not for my participation? And then some folks uh, become very freed by that, and so they know exactly where to go for what God intends for them. But somebody showed this to me one time. What if we did this? What if I took the red pen here? And what I want you to imagine is let's assume that all this was whole whiteboards all the way up to the triangle and across the room. Okay, so just picture that. Okay, what if I took this red marker and I drew this? Now this is an oval, not a circle. I understand. Okay, but what if we pictured the heavenlies and the plan for the heavenlies like this? All right. And then the earthly plan seems a lot more smaller, right, compared to that whole thing. So we tend to, most dispensational charts you see show this little rectangle here, right, and shows us going up. But yet, what if, and everything we're going to learn is we're going to be using in heavenly places, what if all of that is all the way surrounding Israel's plan here on earth? That sort of puts it maybe in a little bit better perspective, if you will, for us, that there's a lot out there, all right? There's a lot coming uh, that this information that we are going to take to those heavenly realms, okay? So that sort of helped me to see that my participation in God's overall plan is a lot bigger than maybe what I think, just simply looking at a timeline, okay? But when you learn grace, it becomes... Very liberating and freeing, um, understanding grace and learning all that we all have learned today. A lot of times, though, folks understand the gospel. If, if you can get them to that point and they understand salvation and they trust in what Christ did for them on the cross, unfortunately, a lot of times their learning stops at that point. Um, and they miss all of the other doctrine for our participation that is written in Paul's words. And if you study Paul and his books, they're very doctrinally heavy. You know, Paul writes like that. There's a lot in there for our participation, for us to study and learn. Um, so they, they learn grace through their salvation and yet um, don't reach their potential because they don't study what comes after. And there's a lot that comes after. And Myron touched on some things, and I'll touch on a few more things today. But then also there's that group of people that study, 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 all right? Um, and there's a lot of fundamentalists out there, and I'm one of them, that you learn the Bible, you, you appreciate it, you love this because now you can make sense of the Bible, and you know what is... The, the important parts to go to. You can open a book of the Bible and understand a lot more what's going on because of, of rightly dividing it. And yet, uh, as was the case for me somewhat, uh, I just kept studying, studying, studying without really applying and taking what I'm learning and living it out as I'm supposed to live it out as an ambassador on this planet. So we're going to get into that a little bit today. And I'm going to touch on a, just a couple things of the grace life. I could have done a lot of different points 
today. And I'm going to, I'm going to talk mainly about three different things under grace. Two of them don't um, either get misapplied or people really don't have an idea how they function now under grace, which is number one, sin. How do you deal with sin uh, under grace? Because uh, either they've come out from under the law or a very tradition-based church that's put them under the law and that's how they've dealt with sin or how they've been told to deal with sin. Or the other one is the Holy Spirit, the function of the Holy Spirit. And we know that the Holy Spirit was very active right after the cross, right? With Peter's group. Uh, what am I going to draw here? Like a dove? This is not going to be pretty. Man, that's, that's just horrible. Anyway. Okay, so the Holy Spirit is there. It's a bow tie, actually. But we know the Holy Spirit was very active there right at Pentecost, okay? And causing uh, Peter's group to, to speak in different languages so that others could hear them and filling them for uh, powers that they would have to go around and present the gospel of the kingdom to people. And so you, it presents a problem if you believe that the church started then because you've got the Spirit doing all of these things, which maybe really isn't a problem for you if you're in a Pentecostal or charismatic church because that's where you plant your doctrine and I'm going to try to produce all those things. But it, a lot of Christianity also plants uh, their foot at Acts 2, and yet somehow they know, you know, I'm, not, I'm comfortable with the tongues thing and I don't know about all that. For us who rightly divide and understand that Paul is our apostle, this isn't a problem for us, and we understand that. We know that the Holy Spirit has changed its ministry. Okay, It's still working, but it's changed its ministry, and we understand that. But this is why you see so many churches now, even mainline denominations, becoming very charismatic or Pentecostal in a lot of their teaching because it's hard for them to reconcile their views on Acts 2 and the beginning of the church and the, the, the uh, Holy Spirit doing what it was doing then. So we're going to talk about that. And then the one final thing I want to talk about judgment today, uh, because if we study the Bible, God is a God of judgment. All right. In every dispensation, we understand that. And there is a judgment for the body of Christ. And that's one thing that a lot of people, when they learn grace and um, become saved under the gospel of Christ, that they don't realize that there is a judgment for the body of Christ. So we're going to get into that a little bit today. Let's, uh, let's pray first. Lord, thank you so much for today. Thank you for these men that have come here to open your word and um, try to make sense of it and uh, walk us through the history, Israel's program that you had with them under the old covenant and then introducing um, your Apostle Paul, who gave us uh, a great body of knowledge, Lord, that you would have us to know and learn and study. And uh, Lord, I, I just pray now that as we study the rest of this hour, that we would take these things to heart, that there are, um, grace does teach us quite a bit about how to live and how to deal with different things. Lord, again, we're thankful for everything you've done for us and continue to do for us uh, through yourself, Lord. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Everybody turn to Romans 3, verse 4. Most people in here can probably uh, recite this verse. If you've uh, gone out and talked to many people about what they believe about the Bible and even people who profess to be Christians, it becomes pretty upsetting and very difficult to deal with a lot of folks because they either um, don't read their Bible and don't believe it's the Word of God and there's a lot of extra revelation out there, or they'll say we can't know the Bible that we have in our hands is the Word of God and it's got problems with it. And so this is a verse that we have to start with. Um, God forbid, yea, let God be true, but every man a liar. And so... As we come to this word, we've got to know and, and, and believe it that it has been preserved. And, and there's a, a man sitting here in the pews that I want to give thanks to real quickly. Um, Nick Titus was uh, always a man that stood for the preserved word of God, and I learned quite a bit from him. 
and understanding that concept. And so that's number one. We've got to believe that and uh, believe that this Bible is going to change us. Now, having said that, there's a spiritual lesson I want to start with, uh, the book of Hebrews. So turn to Hebrews 11. This is the famous uh, chapter of faith where we read about um, the heroes of Israel's history. It can also be problematic, too, for those who believe that Hebrews is written to the church, the body of Christ. And I'm going here uh, for spiritual lesson to try to um, drive home a point, uh, to try to light a fire uh, under you all today. Um, but if we look down through chapter 11, we see some of the heroes of Israel's uh, program. We have Abel, and Abel knew the type of... Uh, sacrifice he was supposed to bring, okay? God had, had made that um, known to him, and he brought the right sacrifice. His brother didn't, and Abel did and, and did what he was told to do. He had faith in God, and God asked him to bring this sacrifice and do it the right way, and he did, and that's how Abel demonstrated his faith. We go down to Enoch, and the Bible tells us that Enoch walked with God, and so by faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death. Moving on, we uh, all know the story of Noah. Noah um, was a preacher of righteousness uh, to um, many people here on the earth before the flood. God told him to build an ark. That's the information that he had. God said, I'm going to uh, flood this earth, and I want you to build an ark. And so Noah, by faith, did what he was requested to of God. <laughs> Moving on, we have Abraham. Uh, he had been called to get in, out of the land that he was in and go into a promised land that God would show him, and he obeyed and by faith demonstrated that by moving on to that land. Continuing down, um, we come to uh, Isaac who blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. Jacob, when he was dying, blessed both the sons of Joseph and worshiped leaning upon the top of his staff. Joseph, by faith, when he died, made mention of the departing of the children of Israel and gave commandment concerning his bones. He asked for his bones to be moved back to the nation of Israel, their land. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents because they saw he was a proper child and they were not afraid of the king's commandment. By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Through faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest that he, lest he that destroyed the firstborn should touch them. By faith the children of Israel, Israel passed through the Red Sea as by dry land, which the Egyptians assaying to do were drowned. So Moses was told some things to do by God. He was told to go to uh, Egypt and speak to Pharaoh and say, let my people go. And so Moses demonstrated his faith by doing what was requested of him. We learn about Jericho. We learn about the two spies that Joshua sent into the land to spy out the land. And, and here's where a, a Gentile shows up in Israel's prophetic program. We have the harlot Rahab, the harlot of all people, who blessed Israel by hiding the spies. And that was part of, of, of the Gentile program by blessing Israel. And she is a demonstration of that. And she did that by her faith. If you go back and read Joshua chapter 2, she talks about how she knows that, that uh, the Lord God of Israel is the true God and he is powerful and we are scared of him and rightfully so. And it's, it's a great demonstration of her understanding of who God is and her faith in that God. And she does... Um, what is requested of her by hiding two Israelites in her room. So I come here not saying that you, there are works to do for your salvation, all right? And I also am not saying that, um, that the works that they did earn them grace, okay? We need to make that distinction, all right? They demonstrated their faith by doing what God asked them to do, but it was completely of God's grace that he found them righteous before him, okay? 
So that's a, that's a really uh, important point there. But the spiritual lesson, I want to kind of, uh, as I said before, light a fire with you guys. You've been given some information today. All right? We all have, have sat here and gone through the Bible. And we've, we've seen um, what Paul has to say to us or, or understood that he is our apostle. And I, God, in a sense, has, has given you some information. And I want you to think about what are you going to do with that? All right? Your salvation is based upon solely what Christ did for you on the cross, apart from any works. And yet we know God has given us some information in Paul's letters. And it's time for us to start doing some work. All right. So I wanted that to be a lesson to say, hey, there are some things that we need to take to heart to study and then to bring to the world. Okay. Now, moving on. Uh, I want to compare and, and contrast a little bit about what Israel had versus the church regarding salvation. And this, this gets a little tricky because you can't go into Israel's prophetic program in the Old Testament and think about them having salvation as we know it in the sense that we have put our faith and trust in what Christ did on the cross and that saves us. Um, that was a foreign concept to them. Their salvation was the land. They wanted to get into that land. Um, and so, yet there's a, there's a lesson from Galatians that I want to present here that sort of uh, will compare and contrast and really bring out what we have versus what Israel under their old covenant have. First turn to Psalm 130. I want to confess, I don't know if this is David or Solomon saying this because you get in later into the, the end of the Psalms and some of them are by Solomon, but Psalm 130 says, Out of the depths have I cried unto thee, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let thine ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. If thou, Lord, shouldest mark iniquities, O Lord, who shall stand? But there is forgiveness with thee that thou mayest be feared. I wait for the Lord, my soul doth wait, and in his word do I hope. My soul waiteth for the Lord more than they that watch for the morning. I say, more than they that watch for the morning. Let Israel hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is mercy, and with him is plenteous redemption. And he shall redeem Israel from all his iniquities. So don't uh, skip over that last line. It's clearly talking about a future salvation for Israel that they did not know of at that point in time. Turn to Romans um, 9 4. Paul's talking about his kinsmen in the flesh, Israel, the Jews that were given the covenants and the promises and the law. He says, I say the truth in Christ, I lie not, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost. Verse 1, verse 2 says, that I have great heaviness and continued sorrow in my heart, for I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ, for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises. Go over to Romans 11, verse 25. Paul continues on, he says, For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. So Paul's clearly saying that Israel does not have their salvation yet. All right? It is, in the, pres it is in, the, in the future. Let's compare, and then let's actually contrast that with what we have as the church now. So go to uh, Galatians 4, 1-2.
Sorry, we're going to read more than the first two verses. It says, Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be lord of all, but is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the father. Even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because ye are sons, God hath sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Wherefore, thou art no more a servant, but a son, and if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Then one more here, Romans eight fifteen to 16. It says, For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. So I wrote up here a quick little synopsis of what we read in Galatians. Paul says, he compares and uh, looks at the, the, um, the difference, or excuse me, the similarity between the child heir and a servant. We know that when a king has a child, that that child being little um, is really no different than the servant as far as the position that they have because they have to learn a lot. All right. Um, any of you that have had children understand that when they're little, you spend a lot of time teaching them right for wrong. Okay. Uh, you give them very little responsibility because uh, they're still learning in their young state. Okay. When we are saved, church, the body of Christ, Paul says that we are adopted sons. I'm going to draw an arrow here. I know I'm getting low on the board. We are adopted grown sons. Now Israel, we know, was an heir. Exodus says that when God took them out of Egypt, they were his firstborn, okay? So they were an heir of, of, of God. And yet we know and we've testified today that um, their understanding was very young. They were under the law and they continuously fell, right? I mean, that's what Israel's history is. It's, it's, a, it's a constant breaking of, of the covenant with God and they had to be punished. You know, there were glimpses. Uh, you had some of the judges who were righteous. You had Solomon. Um, but for the most part, Israel uh, messed up quite a bit. All right, And God had always wanted them to be those grown sons, to be those, we talked about the priests, okay, um, presenting um, God uh, to the world, uh, doing what they were supposed to do, and yet we know that they had a very hard time getting that. You and I, under the body of Christ, are given, because of Christ, we are given this position at the moment that we believe. At the moment that we believe. The problem is, a lot of us in Christianity don't realize what this entails. A lot of times what ends up happening when we don't understand right doctrine according to Paul and we put ourselves back under the law or we just ignore it altogether and just let sin run rampant in our lives like the Corinthians were doing is that we go back to this. Okay? So the problems between the two are slightly different. Israel, under their covenant, was birthed out of, out of Egypt, and they were expected uh, under that covenant to grow up and be that shining light to the world. You and I, immediately, because of Christ, when we put our faith and trust in what He did, are given this position, and yet we have to learn what that position entails for us. All right? So we're given this position. This is our position, and we have to learn how to be like it and act like it. All right? And that's a lot of responsibility on us, the body of Christ. Okay? And that takes time, it takes study, and it takes putting things into practice. All right? And living out the doctrine in your life. All right? 
This is part of grace, though. It's amazing that God has given us this position immediately from salvation. That's where we learn about all of spiritual blessings in heavenly places. Uh, there's no Jew or Gentile. We're not under any other nation, all right? He's already given us a, a place in heaven, okay, that, that we are inhabiting, which is, wrap your mind around that. That's, that's hard to understand, okay? But we have that. We have all of this stuff not having earned it. It's all because of what Christ did, all right? And what our job is to understand all of that and live that out, okay? But, knowing that we're not under the law, how do we deal with this sin issue? If you're like most of us who will be honest, we still have a natural man, all right? There are some Christians that believe they are living in sinless perfection, that they're holy and they're without sin. And I, I think they get a lot of those verses from the New Covenant that the Spirit will inhabit uh, Israel and cause them to do uh, God's law. They also look at books like Hebrews where it talks about losing your salvation if you're not careful. And so they're trying to reconcile those things together. But if you're honest, we have that battle going on that Paul rightfully points out in, in chapter 7 of Romans. How do we deal with sin? And it's an extremely important question because if you understand the beginning of Romans, and let's just go through it real quickly here, okay? Turn to chapter 1. Let's just do a brief survey here. Myron went through some of this. Let's just review. So chapter 1, Paul talks about the fall of man, right? Uh, right from creation. Uh, people were not thankful. We know what happens when men and women are left up to their own pursuits. Doesn't Satan doesn't have to help them out. They will go right down the tube, and that's what exactly happened. Chapter 2, Paul then holds up the, the Jew, right? The person, the, the godly Jew or the Jew that had the law um, and said, you're just as guilty because that's what the law teaches you, okay? And that was its, its point, to show that all men are sinners, okay? Moving on. Then uh, Paul gets into the doctrine of salvation, chapter 3. And I want uh, Romans chapter 3, verse 20. He says, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. So again, Paul teaches us what the purpose of the law is, and that there is no one righteous. Chapter 4 deals with uh, Christ's propitiation. Verse 5 in chapter 4. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. And it's interesting that Paul goes back and shows Abraham and David, two people under the covenant in Israel's program, and uses them as teaching points for us. Um, Abraham was given a promise even before he got a circumcision. All right? So apart from any work that Abraham did, he was given a promise. He simply believed what God told him would happen. And this is, this is demonstrating our salvation and what happens to us believing what Christ did for us on the cross. And then if you look at David, we all know David's story. David committed a pretty heinous sin with Bathsheba and then had her husband killed. And under Israel's program, under the... The, the law, there was no sacrifice for that type of sin. And yet David, God said that he would be forgiven. David said, and it, it says right here, what, uh, verse 7, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Well, David didn't know anything about Christ. He, does, he didn't know what we know now looking back. All right? He understood God had forgiven him. He just didn't know why. And we know because of what Christ has done. But David is a picture of that also. And then chapter 5 deals with our justification. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if a person is honest, this is where you want to be with an individual when you're presenting the gospel to them. Hopefully they've understood that it's 
nothing that they have done. Christ has paid their sin debt for them by the cross. And if they've understood that, then hopefully you can get them to Romans 6. And Paul anticipates the question that the person may ask. Verse 1 in chapter 6. He says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? That's a perfect question for someone who truly understands the gospel. Because if they're at that point, they're thinking, well, now how do I deal with sin? If I'm not under the law, and I can't use the law to get right with God, He did everything for me, how do I deal with sin? Do I just, I just run rampant with my flesh? And I mean, God's forgiven me sins past, present, and future. So that's hopefully when you're presenting the gospel to someone and talking to them about biblical things, where they would come to because you can go right to Romans 6. And Romans 6 is the first step in how we deal with sin for the church, the body of Christ. So he spends the first five chapters of the book dealing with the creation and fall of man, putting the chosen Jew in his place in chapter 2, explaining Christ's death and what it did, using Abraham and David as examples of two folks who had faith in Israel's program simply by believing what God told them. Then he deals with sin in chapter 6. Let's continue on here past verse 1. Verse 2, God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us, as were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Let me point out, there's no water in those two verses. There is no water in those two verses. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of His death, we shall be also in the likeness of His resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with Him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For that he he that is dead is freed from sin. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with Him. Knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise, and here's the important point, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. Key points. Number one, understand what happens the moment you trusted the gospel. You are given an adopted, grown position in Christ. All right? You are given all spiritually blessings in heavenly places. You have a, a uh, position that's given to you completely by what Christ did for you. All right? And that gives a lot of responsibility. Number two, you were baptized or identified with Christ Jesus in His death. You, or rather your natural man, is now dead. You need to remember that every day. Your natural man is dead. Now, it's still there, just as Paul gives his own example in chapter 7 of Romans, that he fought back and forth. We all know in here that we deal with things, okay? But that natural man is dead. You're no longer a servant to sin and are not a slave to it. Paul says back here that under the law, you were a slave to sin because it had dominion over you, all right? You could try all you want to do the law perfectly and continue to do it, and you would break it, and you just keep trying, and you break it, and you just keep trying. And that's exactly what Israel went through. We have something better than that. We have a dead flesh that we live with, okay? You need to stop sinning, take responsibility as a grown adult son in Christ, and don't choose to do it. I would be a terrible um, counselor in a church if people came to me for their personal problems. Because most problems, let's face it, whether it's marriage or whatever, there's sin involved, right? I mean, you have two human beings or whatever. It's 
whatever the, the case is, there's sin is behind it. And um, probably within five minutes, I would get to this point and say, quit sinning. And that would be the end of the conversation, and they would never come back to me because a lot of people don't want to hear that. But anyway, um, a grown person um, makes good choices, okay, the point of that. And we have great responsibility in our lives, all right? Our flesh wants a list, right? Our flesh wants a list to say, do this, do that. God will be happy if you do this, do that, don't do that. I mean, that, that, it's, it's easier in a sense, right? But you have great responsibility, all right? And you're expected to be living as an adopted grown son in Christ, okay? Now, the Holy Spirit plays a big part in that, and we're going to get to that next step, okay? The other bad thing about sin, and to understand one of the things that will help you to deal with sin, is what it does to grace doctrine. Let's turn to Titus chapter 2. Start down in verse 7 with me. It says, In all things showing thyself a pattern of good works in doctrine, showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity, <clears throat> sound speech that cannot be condemned, that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. Exhort servants to be obedient unto their own masters and to please them well in all things, not answering again, not purloining, but showing all good fidelity that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things." to adorn the doctrine. It's very difficult to preach the message of grace if your life is constantly involved in sin and people around you see it. All right, It's very, very difficult. And everyone in here knows what I'm talking about. Paul goes on to say, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that, denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Paul many times talks about the actions of a grace-filled believer. Galatians 6, 9-10. Turn there with me. Galatians 6, 9-10. Paul says, And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. See it again here in 1 Thessalonians 5, 14-15. 1 Thessalonians 5, 14-15. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, be patient toward all men. See that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. And then finally, uh, go back to Titus chapter 2. I purposely left out one of the last verses in that chapter. Verse 14 says, Who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. Don't let anyone teach you or try to convince you that grace is a license to sin. You do not get that idea reading Paul's epistles. Paul is very hard on sin. Very hard on sin. The problem is we have great freedom in grace. We don't have a covenant with God. God was obligated to bless Israel if they did the right thing. We don't have that. But everything we have is what Christ gave us on His death, burial, and resurrection. All right? But we can't use our good works to somehow improve our relationship with God because He's already given us everything we could ever hope to get 
and made us complete in Him. So what we have is better than what they had. It's just that you still have a sin nature and your flesh sometimes wants the law to help corral it. But chapter 7, Paul dealt with that in teaching us that it doesn't work trying to go back under the law. One of the other things that helps in dealing with sin is our position. Um, my kids were taught this very early on when they started learning grace about their position as ambassadors. So turn to 2 Corinthians 5.20. I believe that Myron went here. Okay, 520. It says, Now then we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. If you go up to verse 18, part of our message is this, And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation, to wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. So if you picture an American ambassador that goes to Russia or any other country in the world, they may be living in that country, but they're there representing our government and what our government would like to see happen in our interests, and yet they're in a foreign country. That ambassador would be recalled if everything they said and did was contrary to what our government or president wanted. Correct? I'm not, it's not a crazy idea. So our job, we've got to see ourselves here in a foreign land. All right? And it helps to understand that if our lives through sin are contrary to God, all right, it's going to hurt our effect as ambassadors in this world. Okay, simple as that. Okay, so we've dealt with sin and how the body of Christ should deal with it. Let's move on to another issue that people have when they first learn grace. Well, what is the Holy Spirit's job? Okay, I, I get that the church isn't from doesn't start in Acts two. I, I understand that the, the tongues and those things were for a sign for Israel that um, the people that were there at Pentecost would hear uh, the kingdom doctrine and that they could understand that and they would want um, to become members of uh, the kingdom. Peter was trying to communicate that, and that was a supernatural gift given for that purpose. But what about the Holy Spirit for us, the body of Christ? Well, the Spirit, number one, plays a huge role in salvation. We can't forget that. 1 Corinthians 6, 11. Turn there for me. And such were some of you, but ye were washed, ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. You have a position in the body of Christ from the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 12, 13. So turn a little bit to your right. 1 Corinthians 12. For by one Spirit are we all baptized, excuse me, identified into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one Spirit. He operates within you, sometimes without your knowing. Uh, turn to Romans 8.26. I didn't bring up prayer today, but that's another area that we could talk about. Prayer is another issue that we have a hard time uh, understanding its implications for us, the church, the body of Christ in the beginning, knowing that we're not under a covenant and so many prayers in Israel's history were related to a covenant with God. This verse can also help us understand that. 
Chapter 8, 26 says, Likewise the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. So the Holy Spirit with inside of us prays many times, and we have no idea even what to pray for a lot of the times. Turn to Titus 3, 5. Paul's talking about salvation, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. And then Colossians 2, 11 to 13. So Colossians 2, 11 to 13. In whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead. Ephesians chapter 1 tells you that the Spirit is who places you in the body of Christ when you believe at the moment of salvation. So the Spirit is very active in the believers, or the church believers' um, salvation. But there are things the Spirit cannot do. He can't make you do something. Um, and you can also grieve Him. All right? Ephesians 4.30. So go to Ephesians 4.30. It says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. 1 Thessalonians 5.19 Quench not the Spirit. So there are things we can do in our flesh against the Spirit residing inside of us. Very different, I might add, from Israel's new covenant and the Spirit causing them to walk in His statutes. <laughs> Romans 6, 3-4, we don't need to turn there, we've already read that, but the Spirit crucifies you and gives you newness of life. Romans 8.14 and Galatians 4.6 state that the Spirit identifies you as sons of God. Ephesians 2.6 says that the Spirit has placed you in heavenly places according to Christ Jesus. And then also, and maybe more, uh, most important for us, we are sealed and kept safe in Christ's body until the day of redemption. It's the Spirit's job to do that. So remember, it is your job to put on the new man and walk after the Spirit according to Ephesians 4, 23-24. You're not under the new covenant given to Israel, whereby the Spirit will cause them to do God's law according to Jeremiah 31. And many times our flesh cries out and says, God, make me do this. But we have a... Um, we have a, a dead man that resides with us, and sometimes we can choose to, to, to do and seek after that instead of allowing the Spirit through His Word to guide us. Last thing I want to talk about is the judgment. We know that God is a God of judgment. It started back in the garden. Um, Cain was judged for what he did to his uh, brother. We also know that Adam and Eve were judged because of sin. Um, uh, obviously, God judged the world during Noah's day. It's interesting, I've heard uh, Dr. Henry Morris speak that there's an idea that possibly at that point in Earth's history there could have been more humans then than there are now looking at statistical extrapolations and things. Just something interesting to think about. But God punished the whole Earth. He judged the whole Earth. We know that Israel, right, was judged several times under their covenant. So we know that God is a God of judgment, right? That's... That's just a, a, a practical principle of who God is throughout Scripture. Many, though, that learn grace um, don't understand or don't realize that we have a judgment also as the body of Christ, different from a couple other judgments that I want to touch on first. So if you will go to um, Matthew 25, 31. And this material that I'm going to cover here quickly, I'm just going to do a, just a brief synopsis of it. I would encourage you to go to uh, Phil Berry's YouTube site. 
he is doing an extraordinary job on the judgment seat of Christ. But Matthew 25 talks about a judgment, the judgment of the nations, which I believe is separate than the judgment in Revelation that we'll talk about here in a bit. But Christ is speaking to his apostles. Uh, Matthew 25, verse 31. When the Son of Man shall come in His glory and all the holy angels with Him, then shall He sit upon the throne of His glory. And before Him shall be gathered all nations, and He shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. So you've got the nations coming to Jesus, and He is dividing them according to how they have treated uh, Israel and, and what they have done for them as Rahab, who we talked about before, was a picture of what Gentiles will be like in the tribulation period. There will be Gentiles who honor Israel, understand that they're God's chosen people, and that will help them and do what is right. And you will have many who choose not to do that and come against uh, Israel with, with, um, with all they can. The next judgment I want to talk about, quickly turn to Revelation 20. And this is the great white throne judgment. And I, point, I want to point out, this happens right before chapter 21, which is the new heaven and the new earth coming down on the earth. I believe that this judgment happens at the end of Christ's reign, a thousand year reign here on the earth. Verse 11 says, And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And we understand we're not judged by our works. What we have is because of what Christ did for us. It was his work on the cross then the Holy Spirit has sealed us into the body of Christ until the day of redemption. So we're not there, and that's an awesome thing. We're also not in Matthew 25 with the judgment of the nations because it's not dependent upon us in the body of Christ to elevate Israel up, okay? So we know we're not there. But where are we with judgment? Well, there's two passages I want to go to very quickly here. Um, Romans 14.10 is one of them. It says, But why dost thou judge thy brother, or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. The other area that you see it is in 2 Corinthians 5.10. Paul tells the Corinthians here that uh, in verse 10, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that every one may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. 1 Corinthians 3 tells us a little bit about the judgment, although there's not a lot of information regarding it. Turn with me uh, real quickly to 1 Corinthians 3 to finish up. I used to love hearing that term, finish up, when I was sitting in a lecture in college. Paul says... Uh, now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry, ye are God's building. According to the grace of God which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon, but let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. And then verse 14 goes on to say, If any man's work abide which he hath builded thereupon, he shall receive a reward. Notice verse 12 talks about, now if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and stubble. 
It is my opinion, and you can disagree with me if you want, that I do not believe that we're judged um, simply for us going down and taking a, a bunch of homeless folks' food. Okay, I think, I think that's a good thing to do. Those are good things to do. I believe Paul is getting at, what is our doctrine? Who are we building upon? Are we, how are we preaching Jesus? All right. There's many ways to preach Jesus. Are we preaching Jesus according to Israel's program? Which would be the wrong way at this time to preach Jesus. You know, you hear gospel presentations like that. Um, Jesus is Messiah, right? Christmas time. Uh, that's a big, big message. Um, Jesus died on the cross. Woe is you. You put him there. You need to repent of that. You know, that's a very common gospel presentation I hear. That's not the gospel that Paul proclaims, that he glories in the cross, and it's by what Christ did on the cross that you can be saved. Okay? How are you preaching how a person should live? According to the law or according to grace? And what we learn from Romans 6 and other passages where Roman, uh, Paul talks about being led of the Spirit and reckoning the old man dead every day. All right? Those are the things I believe that we will be judged upon. Okay, so the last thing I want to talk about here is um, I want to give a little personal testimony of how grace has changed me and uh, my wife and a couple different things. Um, the first thing that I want to talk about is I was a youth uh, leader for a couple years at, a, at an older church that we had been at. And... Um, Youth ministry, to me, looking back on it now, I, I, I just think it's all screwed up in, in evangelical Christianity. It's, it's, you know, what kind of cool music can you get up there? And it's, it's let's just praise God, and it's very soft on doctrine, and kids, I think, are, instead of being expected to be functioning as grown adults in Christ, revert back to being servants because they're, put under the law, they, they go back to uh, Jesus' earthly ministry, and it's all about um, living how Jesus lived, as Will brought up, and you know, I mean, Will knows this, they're all spiritualized lessons anyways, you can't do half the things that Jesus did, so you spiritualize it, and then the kids sing about it, and it's, you think you had a great lesson. But I had a, a wrong understanding of, of, of teaching the kids uh, salvation and how to deal with sin. And as a personal um, story, I preached a lot uh, about repentance to kids, and I believe that if they did not show forth the fruit in their life, they were not saved. All right. So I took um, the fruit that Paul talks about, which are spiritual things that Paul talks about that the Spirit inside of you produces, and put the kids into a point that said, if you don't live the right way, you must have not been saved. All right? And I shudder to think what that did to a lot of kids. You know, I really do. I wish I could have those times back now, knowing what I know now. Um, and I would definitely deal with that very differently. Uh, I, I want to kind of give testimony, testimony to, to Monica in our marriage. Uh, I know Monica would tell you many times that her relationship with me in a sense was very law-based because um, she believed that if she was not treating me right as a good wife and doing the things that a good wife should do, that somehow God would be upset with her. And um, do you see how that creeping, that, that, that law-based thinking inhabits marriages? You know, um, I would rather have a wife who wants to love me and honor me um, because she chooses to do that, not because she's expected to do it because she's thinking that she's making God angry at her. Okay? And then one of the saddest things that we did to our own kids when they were little is uh, we used to, you know, of course, have Bible studies or pray with them. And um, when our kids would, would do things wrong and uh, we would try to be talking to them about it and addressing it, we used to use the phrase a lot, well, your life, you just didn't make Jesus happy today with your life. 
And to think about a, a young child hearing that, and you start, you start being told that a lot, it becomes all about behavior, right? It becomes they associate God is happy with me because mom and dad are happy with me that I'm doing the right thing and I did a bad thing and so God is angry with me. As opposed to understanding that the gospel is that Christ died for you while you were yet a sinner, Christ died for you. And then teaching the child how to grow up and handle sin the way that Paul teaches us to do that. Um, the other the other one I want to point out is a friend had told me that um, 1 John uh, 1, 9, if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive you. And, and my friend had told me that he used to do that almost every night. He would have his confession before he fell asleep. So, you know, these things do matter, guys. It, it matters how we live. And, and grace is enough. There's, it, it, grace teaches us how to live, teaches us how to deal with sin, teaches us how to understand the Holy Spirit and its job teaches us that there is a judgment seat of Christ coming, and those things should motivate us to do good works. Good works are a great thing, um, and they're a great thing because Christ paid our fine that we didn't deserve. And out of our thankfulness to Him, number one, we should, we should do good and not sin. So anyway, that's all I have for that. Um, if anyone else wants to say anything, I know that um, we're going to close up. So... Deal with our sin in our everyday life, and it certainly does. And Paul uh, acknowledges that in Romans 6 and 7 and 8, like you mentioned. And there's not a one of us that doesn't go through every day uh, messing that up, you know, not meeting that mark, not meeting that standard. We deal with this dead man that we carry around every day. And so, Grace gives us how to individually deal with that and, and how to stop sinning. You said that we your counselor and answer, and that's Pauline response. That's what you need to stop it. And yet sometimes those of us that have come out of that legalistic background can, can grasp how to understand with our individual issues and our salvation that God has provided to us freely. We can, we can work through that. But when it comes to dealing with other people's sin, this can be a really hot topic, especially when you come out of a legalistic background. And um, you know, Paul does, is not silent on this issue either. And his response is the same, that grace teaches you how to deal with sin in yourself, and it teaches you how to deal with sin with other people. And I thought that I'm going to bring that up because you went to Galatians 6 where he's talking about dealing with people's sin individually. But in the very first verse of the chapter, he says, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness. Bear ye one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. And so he's talking about how not only do we need grace to deal with our sins individually every day, but we need to show that grace to help other people deal with their sin every day as well. You know, the example that a lot of people will throw up is just the, the worst sinner that you can read about in Paul's epistles is that guy in 1 Corinthians 5. He was a, he was a bad man, you know? And, and this is true. He was not doing good things, and Paul told him he needed to stop that and told everybody else that they need to stop supporting that. And in the next epistle that he writes to them, in the second chapter, he says, Paul's crying over this issue. And he says, I want you guys to support this man and to love this man and confirm your, confirm your love to him and accept him as a brother and restore him and build him up. And we so often forget that just like we needed that grace from Christ, we need that from each other in support as we go through this life, carrying these dead bodies around, because it's not easy and we all struggle with it. Anybody else?